I'm here at the Monash Medical Centre today and I'm talking to Dr David Scott, who's a research fellow at Monash Uni's Bone and Muscle Health Research Group. David, thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, talk to me about sarcopenia. What is it and how has the definition of it changed over the years? Yes, so it's a, it's a very new uh, term to a lot of people, but it's actually been a term that's been floating around for about 25 years. Mm -hmm. Um, it was initially described in 1989 by a dietitian uh, from the US who, who suggested that that decline in lean mass that we see in our older adults um, during aging uh, can really have some serious functional consequences. Right. He gave it the name sarcopenia, which he took from the Greek to mean the, the loss of flesh. He thought by proposing a name such as that, then people might start actually giving it a bit more attention. Yeah. And and he was he was quite right actually. So since then, there's been a really exponential increase in in the research into sarcopenia. And what we've seen probably in the in the time since is he was partly wrong in the sense that low muscle mass itself is not actually a really good predictor of, of poor function during aging. It's right. really the the muscle strength itself and and the function of the muscle. So around about the 2010 period, groups of experts got together on sarcopenia and, and they proposed that the, the real definition now should be both the loss of muscle mass, but also uh, a loss of muscle strength. Right. And they proposed, proposed some certain cut points that we can use to, to look at whether people have low muscle mass as well as low function. So one of the things you, you were discussing in the paper that you've written for an upcoming NJA is the relationship between sarcopenia and insulin resistance. Explain to us a little bit the mechanism involved there. Okay, yeah, so there's there's quite a few mechanism, mechanisms by which we could uh, see sarcopenia contributing to, to insulin resistance and, and they haven't been fully explored. But, I mean, in, in the first case, we know that our skeletal muscle is our most insulin sensitive tissue, our largest insulin sensitive tissue in the body. Um, and it accounts for about 80% of glucose disposal. Okay. So if we have low muscle mass in the first case, obviously that can contribute to potentially being insulin resistant. Right. The other thing uh, that we were proposing in the paper is that what we see during aging um, is a decline in the quality of the muscle and there's a few things that go on. In particular, we see mitochondrial damage, mm -hmm. which we know has been linked also with type two diabetes and also uh, increases in uh, fat infiltrating the muscle. So if you imagine a, a nice piece of Wagyu beef, yes. the same thing happens to our muscles as we age. Um, and uh, that has also been linked with increased inflammation and also increased levels of insulin resistance. So what's the prevalence of sarcopenia amongst old people in Australia, do we know exactly? Uh, we really don't know and it's a really tough one to answer because we, we just don't, really have clear definitions at the moment. There's, there's a few different definitions of sarcopenia that are, that are being um, proposed, mm -hmm. and they've only really come into existence in the last five years or so, so we don't really have a lot of data out there that, that can tell us uh, how much of this is going on in the older adult population. I guess if you think how many people are losing muscle mass and strength, yep. it's, uh, it's 100%, we've got, everybody's got sarcopenia. If you think of who's got the low muscle mass and low strength by the the cut points that have been provided, the little bit of evidence we have suggests that it could be up to about 30% in the community wow. dwelling older adult population above yep. the age of about 70. Yep. Um, within obviously nursing homes and, and other um, sort of care facilities, it can be much, much higher. So can we definitively say that there's an association between sarcopenia and the risk of type two diabetes? I don't know if we can definitively say it yet because there has actually been no study that's taken the, the clinical definitions of sarcopenia that we have yep. and looked at whether people who have sarcopenia have a higher incidence of type 2 diabetes. Yeah. I think what we can say is that there's really good evidence now that the people who have the worst muscle strength and the worst muscle mass in, in long, longitudinal studies um, do seem to develop uh, type 2 diabetes at a higher rate. So whether we can definitively say that's that's sarcopenia or it's, it's other factors that are contributing to that. I think it, there's still a bit of research to be done, but I certainly, uh, we certainly think that, yeah, there's, there's definitely, yeah. I think um, certainly myself, before we sort of started looking into this area, I, you kind of think of, of type two diabetes as a condition of obesity, but it's actually also really a condition of aging. So, yep. you know, about 90% uh, of the people who have type two diabetes in Australia are over the age of 40. Yep and it increases with age. So um, 
we've got a growing um, older adult population. We've also got a growing obese population. And it's interesting to note from the research that we're seeing as well that obesity in the older adult population isn't really a, a good predictor anymore of mortality. Yeah. People seem to be living longer with obesity. And that's, uh, I guess, can lead to having a long period of time with type 2 diabetes and experiencing some of the complications that come along with that. One of the things I found interesting in the paper was uh, you had a bit of a chat about metformin, obviously the number one treatment option for type 2 diabetes. It's not a big help, is it? No, there's... For sarcopenia. That's right, yeah, there's no real evidence that, it's, um, that it can improve your muscle mass or muscle function or in an older adult stop them from de declining. Yeah. And in fact, there's, there's some evidence from animal studies that perhaps uh, it could actually have uh, negative effects on muscles. So um, I think, yeah, the idea that uh, by giving metformin, the most common drug for type 2 diabetes, uh, we might see improvements in physical function. It's possible because if people are healthier and they're, and they're able to move more and, and maybe get more active, they might have improvements in their muscle mass and function. But I think that the drugs that's themselves won't really have any, any you know, independent benefit. So how do we lessen the effects of sarcopenia? How do we treat it and manage it? Well, at the moment, uh, we're, we're in, a, in a stage where we really don't have a lot of good evidence on, on the best treatments. Um, there are some drugs that are sort of in phase two trials at the moment for mm -hmm. sarcopenia. Uh, it's certainly getting a lot of attention from the, the drug companies, particularly in the US and, and uh, Europe, um, in terms of, of looking for molecules that can treat the condition. But really the best evidence we have is uh, resistance training using mm -hmm. weights, and, uh, and exercise, as well as perhaps trying to uh, make sure that the diet is adequate. And by that, particularly protein intake in older okay, adults is, yep. is important to um, probably meet the, the um, recommended uh, allowance, if not exceed that when you're performing res resistance training. Because we do know that uh, resistance training seems to have greater benefit if the protein is adequate for the, the muscle rebuilding. What's vitamin D's role in all this? It's so another good question. We, we know that vitamin D is, is often low in people who are obese or have type 2 diabetes, and vitamin, low vitamin D is also associated with sarcopenia. In clinical trials, when we do vitamin D supplementation, there's really not a good amount of evidence that we actually see improvements in, in either insulin sensitivity or, or muscle function. But uh, certainly we think that if we have adequate vitamin D levels, and certainly we should be looking looking at that in, in uh, obese and type 2 diabetic uh, patients. Yep. And there's, there's probably a little bit of evidence to say that the people who have uh, good vitamin D levels will respond a little bit better to, to resistance training and exercise interventions, perhaps in terms of their functional improvements. So if I'm a GP and a, an older patient with type 2 diabetes comes in, it's a fair bet sarcopenia is going to be somewhere in the, in the mix. Mm -hmm. What's my best management plan? Well, I think the, the uh, management plan that we'd like to see um, happening now is, I mean, sarcopenia can be quite simple to, to look at and, yeah. and, to look, and to look at whether your patient has that. Um, a simple way would be to have them just rise from the chair they're sitting on five times without using their arms and say, can you do that? And if, if they're not able to do that, that's actually quite a good uh, predictor of, of having increased uh, functional risk of functional decline in, in the coming years. So that's, that's a good way to, I guess, assess whether the person might have sarcopenia. And then from that that's a stage, I think really thinking about their, their exercise plan, whether there's something that they can be doing that uh, can potentially uh, improve their muscle function. And um, utilising exercise physiologists uh, is certainly a good way to, to move down that path. And I think particularly in the case where someone might have type 2 diabetes as well, I think it's really important to engage exercise physiology because they're they're well trained in, in terms of knowing the, the potential risks and, and side effects of that exercise. The exercise can also be quite uh, simple, quite easy to perform. There's simple things like ankle weights, mm -hmm. um, resistance bands that can be bought for, for very low cost, can be done in the home, and uh, just give that person an opportunity to increase their, their muscle function and become more mobile. Something that we touched on uh, was uh, the, res the resistance to the beneficial effects of exercise, yes. which is yes. yeah, quite a, a new research area, but essentially um, we're seeing that about 20 to 30% of people with type 2 diabetes um, don't s seem to get any improvements in their metabolic health in response to an exercise program, okay. which shows that exercise doesn't necessarily cure all. Um, 
but I think it also shows the need for for us uh, to to think about exercise as a, as a drug in, in a lot of ways. So if we were to prescribe a drug, we would monitor how that is being used and how, how um, what effects it's having, and we mm -hmm. need to do the same with exercise. So it's possible that you can give a, a certain type of exercise to a, a type two diabetic patient or one with sarcopenia, and they come back and you see no real improvement a few a few months later. But it's just a matter of potentially modifying the exercise, looking at different ways for things that can be done, looking at potential barriers as to why people aren't able to do the exercise, and uh, and trying to um, help with that as much as possible. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much.